Hi. I don't have chocolates. Okay. This is, uh, is a naked mole rat. It's possibly the world's ugliest animal. And it's a sought after animal for evolutionary biologists because it has a fascinating biology. Um, it lives in Africa. They dig tunnels, they live underground. They have these, they dig the tunnels with those giant rodent teeth. Um, and they live in societies, very similar to bee and ant societies. Um, they have a reproductive queen, so she sits on top of her workers here. And she's the only female that's allowed to reproduce in the colony. And all the other individuals are workers, so they have to dig, they have to go foraging, they have to clean. And, um, and that, um, it, as I said, is very similar to honeybee or ant societies. And so, um, more recently, um, naked mole rats have become a target for cancer research. And this has um, culminated in a publication just a few weeks ago in a journal called Nature. It's a very prestigious journal. And it turns out that naked mole rats are resistant to cancer. So their cells don't proliferate uncontrollably, causing cancer. Um, and as a consequence, naked mole rats grow incredibly old, up to 30 years, which is incredible because a similar sized mouse only lives about four, three or four years. Now, what's really intriguing about this story is no one would have predicted that naked morets are great for cancer research. And the discovery that they're resistant to cancer is really based on some basic biology that people were observing in the naked morets. Now, they just noticed that they're just not dying, uh, these critters. It's pretty basic. Uh, <laughs> you, you can do this at home. Um, so um, the animal, of course, we use for finding out more about the biology of cancer is this one. That's the mouse. And the mouse is really the target for cancer research. And an incredible amount of resources and researchers and laboratories are working on mice trying to understand uh, cancer and the biology of the mouse is, is fundamentally different to the biology of the naked mole rat. Um, it's not naked. It uh, is. It's susceptible to, can uh, to cancer. It's incredibly susceptible to cancer, and that's what makes it so interesting for cancer researchers to work on. And just to illustrate how much effort, research effort, goes into the mouse, I've just plotted here. Um, I love data. Uh, I've plotted here. Um, I'm not holding back either. Um, but in here, the, numbers, the number of papers that have been published since 1994 on cancer in the mouse. And it's about over, over 6,000 papers. And in 2012 alone, it's about um, uh, over, over 550. So that just indicates how busy researchers are just looking at the mouse and cancer in the mouse. <coughs> now in biology, this sort of uh, concept of concentrating research onto a very few numbers of species is, is quite common. It's been the practice for many decades now. And we call them uh, model species, biological model species. And there are a few out there. Um, we have the worm, C. elegans. We met the mouse already. There's the fish, several fish. And of course, the fly, the fruit fly, Drosophila. And for plants, it's this one, Arabidopsis. So these are biological model species. And what they have in common is that incredible focus research effort on their biology. So many researchers, many labs, lots of dollars just go into these few selected species. And the power of this approach of focusing research just on a few species is undeniable. We know so much detail about, this, about the biology of these few species that is, that we can find out incredible stuff. For example, again, a recent paper published in Nature on the fruit fly. And we know so much about a fruit, fruit fly that, we, that these people, the researchers, have found out which brain cells are responsible for lowering, for the fruit fly, for responding to food. And it, it's essentially the fruit fly sticking out its tongue to get to the sugar, so it's lowering that piece of mouth part that the arrow is pointing at. And it's two, two neurons in the brain that are controlling 
this response. And that is incredible. It's incredible that we can find out to so much detail how the food fly works. And considering this power of such focused research, it's not surprising that there is uh, voices in, in, in the field, researchers, governments, granting bodies that are suggesting that biologists should really abandon their research on the lesser known species and really join and focus research on those species where we already have, on those model species where we already have quite a bit of understanding. And the idea is that it's much more efficient, it's more uh, effective, and it, it's a bit of, uh, it's more bang for your buck by going into these model species. But this assumption has one uh, big flaw, and that is the assumption that if you study the biology of one species, or two, or three, or four, automatically that translates into knowing the biology of, of all the other species. You know, the biology is very similar. And I think my example of comparing the naked mole rats with the mice really illustrates that that's not the case. Their biologies are fundamentally different, even though they're relatively closely related. They're both rodents. Um, but one is susceptible to cancer, and one is seemingly resistant to cancer. So they're fundamentally different biologies. So in future, we really have to balance how we uh, allocate our research efforts. We have to balance between drilling into further and further detail in a few selected species versus going out and trying to make discoveries that we haven't even known were out there in, men, in, in, in some of those many millions of understudied or even unstudied species. Because it doesn't matter how hard we look in the mouse would have never discovered resistant to cancer because it's just not there. It's not part of their biology. Now this balance is particularly important for Australia and the Pacific region, which is just brimming with curious, unstudied species. And I've had over the last uh, decades or so, I've had the opportunity to study some of them. And here's just some, some short stories. This is a, um, we studied some um, Mantids from Queensland, they love running up and down trees. They also like copulating, as you can see. Um, we worked on those. Um, St. Andrew's cross spiders, big orb web spiders uh, that you probably see in your garden in the summer. So the big individual, that's the female, a tiny little one is the male. Um, so we like working on those. Um, yeah, sexually cannibalistic mantids, we do like work on those as well. So the big one again, the green one, the female, one without the head, the male. Um, I like to say that it's not necessary for him to lose the head, but the head is not necessary for mating either. So uh, he can go on, he can go on for eight hours without a head. It's, yeah, it is, yeah. And then she eats the rest of him as well, afterwards. Uh, we've worked on these uh, charismatic alpine grasshoppers that change color from a very dark brown, almost black, to a bright turquoise in minutes. It's fascinating. And of course, we also went to Malaysia and we worked on the enigmatic um, orchid mantis, which resembles uh, flowers and the uh, pollinators, which then eats, of course. Um, so we've, we've been studying a lot of those um, unstudied species. And if you ask me, well, have you found anything about cancer, any, any cures? No, I haven't. But we are slowly unraveling their biology, and, and we just don't know what sort of discoveries these species may hold in the future for us. So. The question, the answer to the question is where should we look for biological discovery in the future is very simple. We just have to look everywhere. Thank you.